Natural rubber is the, the major source of the world's rubber for high pressure applications. It's used in tens of thousands of products, um, most notably in the production of over 3 billion tires per year annually. And this is because natural rubber is strong and abrasion resistant in a way that just cannot be matched by synthetic rubber. The tree originates from Brazil, but it was already shipped to Europe in the 18th century. It was used in various products. The, the problem with it was that it melted when it got hot and it got brittle when it got cold. So in 1839, Goodyear famously discovered that by accident, actually, that by heating rubber together with sulfur, you could make the substance more stable. And uh, around the same time, Dunlop reinvented the pneumatic tire. And then uh, Wickham brought several thousand seats from Amazonia to Kew. This is sometimes referred to as the first act of biopiracy because he declared those seats at the border simply as uh, delicate specimens for Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> so uh, rubber was planted widely in British Asian colonies ever since. And the demand for the product has essentially been increasing ever since. And as you can see from the graph here at the bottom right, the price is very volatile. In the last decade, the prices have rocketed to unprecedented heights, mainly driven by the um, fastly growing Chinese automobile industry. And the global production has doubled since 2000 to now 50 million tons per year. And due to uh, uh, the presence of a pathogen in Brazil, which can essentially wipe out entire plantations, 90% of this rubber is produced in Southeast Asia now. And so the high price in Southeast Asia has led to rapid and unregulated conversion to monoculture rubber um, and large amounts of forest cover loss. It's worth noting that the majority of rubber is produced by smallholders. So on the one hand, the crop has brought wealth to many impoverished areas. But there are uh, many social concerns arising from a host of issues. For example, those smallholders are now dependent upon global markets, of which they have little knowledge. Price fluctuations expose them to risks. And when farmers convert their entire land to rubber, they're narrowing their income sources and arguably have less food security. And then also, there are land grabbing practices by companies who take advantage of weak legal, le legal frameworks and unsecure tenureship. Um, in countries such as Laos and Cambodia, and this is obviously of major concern. And then there are many environmental problems. Uh, clearance of forests, loss of biodiversity, reduction in soil uh, and carbon storage, and reduction in soil productivity, declining water quality, because usually you have to apply a lot of agrochemicals to grow rubber, and regional water deficits, as the crop has a very high evaporative demand. And these environmental issues are likely to be particularly severe when rubber is being planted in marginal climates, which aren't ideally suited for the crop. This figure shows the rubber production by country. And you can see that until relatively recently, rubber was almost entirely produced in tropical Southeast Asia. But as the demand has risen and as the traditional rubber growing area are converted to the even more lucrative oil palm, rubber production is essentially pushed up further north into more marginal areas, for example, northern Thailand, China, and Vietnam. This map shows in red areas that are particularly suitable for the crop. Um, because they have a climate that's very similar to the climate the crop originates from. And then in blue and grey areas that are less suitable. And as you can see, continent of Southeast Asia, which is the hotspot of the recent expansion, doesn't have a lot of optimal growing space anyway. And the majority of rubber plantations, which you can see as the black dots, are located outside of this space. In many of these areas, rubber is surviving, and this is due to the development of hardier clones. But this doesn't necessarily equate to long-term sustainability. We estimate that over 50% of the production area is located in environmental risk zones, where there are regular frost, typhoons, landslides, or droughts. And this is associated with a high risk of plantation failure. So the list of recent examples of plantation failures is very long. Here are just a few. For example, um, farmers in Vietnam have lost plantations worth 250 million US dollars due to typhoons in 2013 alone. And even just this year, there has been a major drought affecting much of the northern production area. And maybe the worst of this is that following the price boom, rubber farming is actually no longer lucrative in many of these areas, particularly the marginal climates where the yields tend to be lower and also the quality of the farmed rubber is, is not as high as it is in the optimal production areas. 
And yet, this boom and bust pattern has led to vast amounts of loss of ecologically important habitat. In continental Southeast Asia, rubber has replaced over 50,000 square kilometers of forest. And between 2005 and 2010 alone, 2,000 square kilometers were planted in protected areas and conservation corridors. In Cambodia, 40% of the conversions have taken place in protected areas. And uh, much of these conversions, particularly in forest, have taken place in areas which are risk areas. So rubber farming may not actually be long-term sustainable there. In 2010, we tried to predict with models what forests might be at greatest risk of future conversion based on the spread we've seen between 2005 and 2010. We had various candidate predictors for that, but interestingly, the predictor that explained the vast majority of variance is simply the distance to the nearest plantations. So farmers are copying a seemingly lucrative activity from each other. And this is the actual forest conversion due to rubber between 2009 and 2014, mapped by our colleagues based on MODIS imagery. So in quite a number of areas, forest loss was actually predictable. Uh, and just as we had predicted, a lot of these conversions continue to take place in protected areas. So this wildlife sanctuary lost another almost 1,000 square kilometers of forest since 2010. Uh, and much of the conversions take place in the absence of clear land tenureship. In the example of this wildlife sanctuary, a company was granted a concession for disputed land, immediately began clearing it because they have to use it within the next 12 months, uh, despite protest of villagers. The situation now is that many farmers, particularly small-scale farmers in, in marginal areas, are actually forced to switch land use already. And uh, price bubbles such as this are typical for rubber. Essentially, the price is high when there is a large gap between the supply and the demand. But as farmers respond by converting land, the price then crashes again. And it, the price is also dependent upon the oil price, exchange rates, and the climatic influence on yield. So the earliest price recovery is expected for 2022. And because many companies currently suspend tapping, there's actually a greater production potential still on the market. So price recovery may be very slow. This is, on the one hand, good news for biodiversity because the conversion to rubber has slowed, but it still continues. And in many areas, uh, for example, China's main production area, forest loss has recently accelerated again. And a possible explanation for that is that because rubber is a long-term investment, farmers are still waiting with their plantations in the hope that prices may rise again. But they have to clear more land in order to secure an alternative income in the meanwhile. So an, an important question is whether the natural rubber will in future be replaced by synthetic rubber. Um, the industry definitely has an interest in this because the security of the supply is endangered, mainly due to this pathogen in Brazil, which would cause havoc if it ever got to Asia, but also because of the climatic influences on yield and climate change. Until recently, the abrasion resistance of natural rubber was not matched by that of synthetic rubber. But earlier this year, a German research institute announced the development of a synthetic rubber that apparently has 30 to 50 percent less abrasion than natural rubber. And the scientists believe it can be produced at industrial scale using existing plants. So research in that area is continuing. But at current pricing, natural rubber has a significant cost advantage over synthetic rubber, which is coupled with the oil price. And, and from an environmental perspective, the desirability of synthetic rubber is very questionable because it's very carbon emis emission intensive to produce it. So are there better natural alternatives? Latex is, after all, produced by over 2,000 plant species. And there are some promising uh, candidates, for example, the Kazakh dandelion and also a semi-arid shrub, which is in the same family, Asteraceae. Um, both these species can be grown in marginal climates. And they can also be grown on industrial wasteland, because toxins are less of an issue for rubber, which is a product that's not, not normally consumed. Um, but so far, to the best of my knowledge, the only commercial product that uses one of these alternatives is a wetsuit range produced by Patagonia. And the European tyre company Continental is experimenting with the use in tyres. A lot of investment would be needed to bring these alternatives up to scale, and my understanding is that neither is currently commercially sufficiently viable to make that happen. So in the absence of uh, fit-for-scale alternatives, the question then is whether rubber could not be produced more sustainably. 
And what's promising in this respect is that uh, there is actually an increasing awareness now in the sector that, uh, that th its production at the moment is problematic. And Michelin was one of the first companies to announce the intention to track supply chains and to only use rubber that has not led to new deforestation. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, uh, several governments, NGOs and companies got together to form the Global Platform on Sustainable Natural Rubber, which will work in a fashion that's similar to the roundtable on sustainable palm oil. And so the founding members account for 65% of the global tire manufacture, which is quite uh, encouraging. But the challenge to make the sector more sustainable is, is enormous, not least because rubber is produced by over 6 million smallholders. So tracking the supply chains is a massive uh, task. And agroforestry, which is often hailed as the environmentally more um, friendly version of cr um, producing rubber, is simply less lucrative for farmers. So it's a hard sell and in many countries lacks political support. So just to wrap this up, um, rubber is essentially an example for a crop that has driven sad and predictable loss-loss scenarios, whereby high biodiversity land has been cleared for a crop that has br brought short-term uh, returns in many areas, has been failing, and ultimately has also been risking the livelihoods of small-scale farmers. And the underlying reason that's no news to anybody here is that natural capital is insufficiently valued. Um, without wanting to go into too much detail, I just wanted to bring up a few figures uh, as example comparisons. So these are the returns on plantations during the time when rubber was still lucrative. So it was very lucrative, almost as lucrative um, as oil palm, but oil palm is much less labor intensive, which makes that crop often more interesting for farmers. Um, and this is the estimated value of a hectare of natural tropical forest, which is of course incredibly difficult to quantify um, but it's likely to be some 50 to 300 times higher than a, a plantation. So the future of natural rubber is very hard to predict. What's safe to say is that the demand continues to increase and there is uh, some likelihood that prices may rise again. Um, I believe also that the problem is not the individual crop and boycotts are often not the answer because particularly in this case, they would disproportionately affect small scale farmers who are economically not flexible and one would in inadvertently force them to clear more land to secure then an alternative income. Um, I believe the problem is the lack of uh, regulation on this market driven deforestation and the lack of access of farmers to sufficient knowledge. And boom and bust patterns like this for rubber are typical for other crops. We've just seen it in Chinese bananas as well. Um, there is a need for certification schemes and greater consumer awareness. Rubber is, one of, is probably one of the only tree crops that doesn't yet have a certification scheme. Um, and in order to make that happen, we need to understand the supply and value chains very well because these certification schemes often lead uh, to disadvantages for smallholders who cannot afford the premiums for the certification. Meanwhile, bigger companies can easily do that. Um, and of course, I believe there's a, a great need for policy regulation that is coordinated across borders in order to reduce the unregulated deforestation and the exposure of uh, smallholders to risks. With that, thank you.